Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of Follow Your Path. My name is Abdul Abid, and I'm a surgical pathology fellow at the University of Pittsburgh. And today we will be talking to Dr. Miguel Reyes Muica. He is a professor of pathology and the chair of pediatric pathology at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. We are also joined today by a future pathologist, Virginia Fernandez. Welcome to the show, Dr. Reyes. Thank you, Abdul, and thank you, Virginia. It's a pleasure to share with you my uh, humble experience. So starting off, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and you where you went to medical school and residency? Sure. I'm a fully made in Mexico product. I was born in Mexico City and grew up there, uh, spent there most of my uh, young adult life, um, and uh, went to the National uh, University of Mexico called Uni uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, the Faculty of Medicine, the, the School of Medicine there, which is one of the largest uh, schools in the world. And my class, for example, have 5,500 people. So it's a large place. And Mexico City is also one of the largest cities on earth and is the largest in the continent together with Sao Paulo and LA. Uh, it was a busy uh, place. It continues to be and the school offered excellent level of uh, training and education, but also had a significant number of difficulties given its size and the uh, not plentiful resources like we see in other places in the world. But you can get one of the best educations there. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so was there a particular faculty member or mentor that inspired you to choose a pediatric pathology as a career? Well, yes, although before getting into pediatric pathology, I should tell you that my parents were physicians, both of them. And uh, my father was also a lawyer in his later years, but um, I wanted to be like him and my mother, and I wanted to do uh, internal medicine. But in uh, early in my medical school, I met my main mentor, someone that you see there, the picture there, uh, his name is Rui Perez Tamayo. Sadly, he passed away this year in, the, in January uh, at 97 years of age. And he was one of the huge figures in pathology of the 20th uh, century. He trained as a pathologist with Dr. Lauren Ackerman at Washington University. And he was my um, mentor. I took my course of pathology with him. He invited me to work in his lab uh, he always did that every year, and I spent with him some years doing electrophoresis and extracting collagen. He was a collagen expert, and that really marked my life because then I wanted to be like him, and I wanted to be a pathologist. And after that, I met a few other people that were doing pediatric pathology. I entered the residency of pathology with Dr. Perez Tamayo in the same School of Medicine of the uh, UNAM, the National University of Mexico. And uh, I rotated through his hospital, which was the center of the residency program, and the National Institute of Pediatrics, where two of his students, three of his students, were my mentors too. Uh, their names are uh, Cecilia Ridaura, uh, Eduardo Lopez Corella, and Joaquin Carrillo. The three of them are excellent pediatric pathologists, and I follow on their steps. Later on, I told Dr. Perez Tamayo that I wanted to come to the U.S. to explore what was here. I'd never planned to stay in this country. And he put me in touch with my second main mentor, the person that you see there in this um, picture right there, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Francisco Gonzalez Cruzzi, a Mexican by uh, birth. But he was the chief of pathology at Children's Hospital of uh, Memorial a Children's Memorial Hospital in Northwestern, now called Lurie Children's. I went to spend one year with him. I ended up spending four years with him. And uh, the last of those four years was uh, an official ACGME approved fellowship in pediatric pathology. That's how I started. In your opinion, what makes pediatric pathology uh, a unique specialty? Pediatric pathology is a very different uh, subspecialty within the um, field of pathology because we don't define it by 
uh, organ or system. Uh, uh, we define it by age. And the key word in pediatric pathology is development, Virginia. Uh, everything that I see in the pediatric pathology world is linked somehow to development. So much that I always tell my uh, trainees, residents, and colleagues, junior colleagues, that the first question that you ask when you are looking at a pediatric specimen is not where the lesion is, not how started, how old is the patient? That's the most important question, to set your mind to, towards the epidemiological uh, possibilities, and from there you take over. That's uh, yeah. That that's definitely that makes it pathology pediatric pathology unique. Can you share um, an interesting case with us that has stayed on with you throughout your career in pediatric pathology? Yes, and I apologize. I should have um, opened a um, a uh, picture because I I can do that if if you allow me to. Yeah, sure. Um, I. Um, was practicing as a pediatric pathologist in the National Institute of Pediatrics when um, I got a uh, biopsy from a patient that had been previously biopsy. Actually, there was a biopsy from a patient that uh, was sent to us and Dr. Ridaura saw it. And then uh, I got the full resection. Let me show you this picture because it's a it's an impressive uh, image. Uh, this is can I share my screen or can yeah, I yeah, just yeah, put you it share, here? Yeah. You can share your screen. Yeah, I can share my screen. So yeah. uh, let me just share it now. Oh, it's disabled. Oh, uh, if you can enable uh, the sharing, yeah. yeah. Okay, there you this, go. This was uh, what at that time was called the case of the year or the case of whatever uh, uh, year, week, month, etc. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, came to us, uh, mm -hmm. this patient. This right. was a, a neonate that no one knew if uh, it was a girl or a boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a previous biopsy that Dr. Ridaura, who you see here, sitting with me in, in my office a couple of years ago, she came to visit. She called it a pigmented schuanoma because there was mm. pigment. And yeah. it was a lesion that had a lot of these corpuscles called wagner meissner corpuscles or mm -hmm. Masson's corpuscles. But it turned out really to be a nevus. These are the corpuscles that we saw. This is a different case, but identical to it. Mm -hmm. the, the chief of dermato, uh, the, the pediatric dermatology in that hospital was Dr. Ramon Ruiz Maldonado, a good friend of mine. And he told me, you know, I think this is a nevus. Mm -hmm. And then in Chicago, I saw this other case that looked similar because it's a newborn with a giant pigmented nevus and a huge mass in the perineum. Mm -hmm. And we decided to publish this with Dr. Gonzalez Cruzzi, the plastic surgeon, Dr. Bruce Bauer, who continues to be my collaborator, and a former colleague of mine who sadly passed away with COVID last year. And we put it uh, as a bulky nevocytoma of the perineum. And I have continued seeing these cases. This is, by the way, the surgery after uh, this mm -hmm. lesion was reconstructed. So that was the case that marked my uh, my life professionally to develop mm -hmm. my uh, research and academic career on the uh, neural crest disorders. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. What would you say is the most uh, gratifying aspect of your job? Listen, uh, children don't get sick very often. They um, can get sick mildly, frequently, but generally they are very healthy and resilient. And um, they, um, when they get sick, they can get uh, serious disorders. And that's when we pathologists get to see them. Uh, because of my interest in what I just showed you on the previous cases that uh, I published and I have continued researching those, I have a lot of interaction with families that uh, have children born with those disorders, giant congenital nevi, which is a very rare disease. It occurs in one in half a million newborns. So frequently, patients and families from all over the world consult me. And my satisfaction of speaking with them, explaining 
what is happening, helping them to come to a fine diagnosis and a plan for therapy. That's probably the most rewarding aspect of my life professionally. The help that I can provide to children, which impacts many more years than what you do with an adult. When you are mm-hmm. sick at 50, you don't have the same expectations of life than when you are sick at five months of age. Hmm. Yeah, that, that definitely is. Uh, it's very, very interesting. So for, from a training perspective, what is training like in pediatric pathology uh, typically? And is there a fellowship and is there a board exam after that? Yes. Uh, uh, the answer to both, both questions is yes. There is a formal ACGME approved fellowship in pediatric pathology. There are about 26, 28 programs in the country. Uh, not all of them fill. Uh, um, and uh, there are about um, 40 positions open right now for pediatric pathologists in academic centers in the US. Mm-hmm. So it's a very marketable, marketable specialty. You have to uh, spend a year uh, of training in a center like this one. We actually have one of the oldest pediatric pathology fellowships and one of the most uh, recognized ones in the world. Um, Many people around the world have have trained here. You spend 12 months looking at surgical pathology, autopsies, cytopathology, molecular pathology, you name it. And you Mm -hmm. see from infectious disease to neoplasia, from malformations to metabolic disorders anything and everything from brain to skin. So uh, at at the end, you sit for a board exam uh, uh, sanctioned by the American Board of Pathology, which includes uh, anatomic and clinical pathology questions in pediatrics. And what advice would you have for residents who are considering uh, this specialty during residency? Well, embrace it with passion. That is not only for pediatric pathology. Uh, concentrate in development, learn how organs develop and how they change. If you look at a histologist's life from the heart of a one week old, it looks very different from a one year old, and it looks very different, that one, from a 50 year old. So you need to know how our bodies change with age. And uh, you uh, should embrace pediatric pathology with the passion to learn how you can help children. That's Mm -hmm. my strongest advice to someone that is uh, dedicating uh, her life to pediatric pathology. Are there any resources that you would recommend or any any societies that people can join to sort of like get a foot in the door for pediatric pathology? Absolutely, there are multiple societies. The United States and Canada have a combined Society for Pediatric Pathology, SPP, Uh, You have the ability to enroll when you are a fellow or even before that as a junior member. It's very inexpensive and it allows you to uh, access to all the resources that they offer. I have been president of that society. Um, There is an equivalent society. uh, That society has about 800 members, but there is an equivalent society in Europe called the Pediatric Pathology Society with a British spelling in pediatrics. And uh, it has less members, about uh, 190, something like that. And they both uh, offer resources. They have meetings, uh, yearly meetings, annual meetings, uh, sometimes two meetings per year. And there is also a Society for Latin American Pediatric Pathology. There is an Australasian Pediatric Pathology Society. And there is an umbrella organization, which is called the International Pediatric Pathology Association, EPA of which I was president too, and it uh, encompasses all of the other societies. So if you are a member of any of the societies that I just mentioned, you are automatically a member of EPA. And Mm -hmm. uh, I advise everyone to look them up. They They are very collegial, very nice platforms to learn from. We give courses and seminars, et cetera. Wonderful. So moving on to slightly different topic. Is there a WHO Blue Book for pediatric tumors? And were you involved in that project? Yeah, um, rumor has it, right? Uh, (laughs) For 67 years, the WHO has been publishing their um, Blue Books. And uh, you can see them right there at Mm -hmm. the end behind uh, (laughs) Dr. Perez Tamayo's picture. 
Uh, those are really the main resource for pathologists around the world, and also for oncologists, radiologists, and epidemiologists in many different countries. Uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic started, I got uh, news that the uh, WHO wanted to plan a book on pediatric tumors. The problem is that, see guys, uh, pediatrics is always pushed to the side in medicine. Uh, all pediatric specialties are a little bit pushed aside. And that is not an exception in pathology. Uh, so all pediatric tumors have been described in multiple blue books. If you open the uh, OBGYN book, there are pediatric tumors, uh, teratomas there. If you open the uh, genitourinary book, you, you see testicular tumors there. If you open the thoracic, uh, thoracic tumors, you see pl uh, pulmonary tumors or pediatrics there. But there was never an attempt to have a book written uh, only on pediatric pathologists and mainly by pediatric pathologists. Uh, only on pediatric tumors and mainly by mm. pediatric pathologists. So I explained to the editor-in-chief, Dr. Ian Cree, and um, he heard me. He, uh, he, he said that it was an important point because most of the descriptions of the pediatric tumors that appear scattered in the other blue books are nicely written by experts, but experts that are not pediatric pathologists and see mm -hmm. very little numbers of pediatric tumors, mm -hmm. whereas we see them every day. So he heard that and he asked me to become uh, an expert editor of the book. I accepted and he asked me to name a few other people that could be expert editors with me. And he had also invited a number of neuropathologists because uh, brain tumors are the most frequent solid tumors in children. So between the group of neuropathologists that also wrote the CNS tumors book and a group of people that uh, we suggested, uh, we invited and we finished pu uh, putting together a two volume on pediatric tumors. This is the first time that there is uh, this effort on pediatric tumors. And this is the first time that WHO has a two volume book. And uh, there are more than 400 authors. The book was published online in February. It's available. We use it every day, multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. And everyone has been very uh, satisfied and excited with this. We are now reviewing uh, proofs for the printed version. And we expect to have it soon printed, but it's available online. And it mm -hmm. has a lot of digital images and a lot of links that you can go directly without trying to go through the pages, mm. printed pages. So it's a very important resource and I am very excited and proud with this with this thing. So um, thank you for asking. <laughs> Just one last question that I have. Uh, on your microscope, I see that there is a bird on the top. Are you a bird person and what bird is that? This is Ethan. It's a small uh, eagle. Mm. This was the favorite toy of Nathan uh, uh, Carson. And that's why the name of this bird is Nathan. Uh, Nathan was born with uh, the disease that I study that sometimes does not uh, have skin lesions, but has brain lesions. He died, sadly, in uh, Palo Alto in California. His parents contacted me and donated uh, tissues from his autopsy and donated a significant amount of money for our research purposes. Uh, we have a funding uh, page for uh, the Nathan Carson uh, efforts. We are trying to develop a, a mouse model for the disease. And that's why I keep Nathan here to uh, keep my attention in what I need to do. That's amazing. That's, yeah, that's an inspiring story. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that's our show for today, folks. You can find Dr. Reyes on Twitter. His Twitter handle is uh, M Reyes M, M R E Y E S M. And thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, if you like the show, please like and subscribe to our channels on YouTube and Apple. And we will be back with another episode soon.